good idea is the purest form of Zionism that you can find in Israel. People that have the idea and the dream to living in an ideal uh, society. It means that they have to agree about everything. How to speak to each other, what to eat, how to work. Sharing your life with, with other people, even if they are your friends, it's very hard, like to, like to do a tango with 400 people. Our story starts right over here on the Sea of Galilee. This is where Yeshua, Jesus, performed many of his first miracles. A hundred years ago, a group of zealous pioneers arrived on these shores with one idea in their head, starting something that was never known before, the kibbutz. But the kibbutz is more than the sum of all of its parts. This group of atheist socialists came to the country and fulfilled biblical prophecy. They came back to the land, brought the Jewish people back to the land, and started working the land again for the first time in thousands of years. This is the story of the kibbutz. The founders of the kibbutz were people who were influenced by revolutions and by pogroms. They felt they are doing something unique after 2,000 years. They are rebuilding a nation. That a new era is coming, that we have to come back to this land and we have to recreate the Jewish concept of a society. The ideology was everything. And they were willing to sacrifice everything for the ideology. There's no way with, without a dev, total devotion that uh, they could build the kibbutz. And the only way was possibly this way of communal life. Everybody shares everything. And they looked for the hardest place. And if you look at the borders of Israel, there is no Israel without the kibbutzim around in the borders. The first settlers, yes, for them, the way of life can be very easily compared with a religion. It was something sacred. We live here near the lake of Tiberias. This lake contains so many dreams. From the beginning, the founders of the kibbutz started to fish and to think about St. Peter. We are not Christians, we are Jews. But we see in this community of Jews who started to live on this lake as Christians, uh, as fathers of our ideas of living together. It was sacred to work the land, guard the borders, foresee all luxury, and really work very hard and believe in, in, in having a common goal of building the country. The concept of the kibbutz is relatively simple to explain. Everyone shares everything they have, they work together, and they live together. The laborer and the manager have the same wages. We travel to Manara to meet with Rachel Rabin, the sister of former Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. Manara is the highest kibbutz in the country. And as Rachel and I walked through the kibbutz, I realized how small our country is and the magnitude of the miracle it is that these different kibbutzim have persevered, not just survived, but in many cases have been successful. I've born and grew up in Tel Aviv, and all my education was social Zionist education. Our dream and ideal was to build a kibbutz somewhere in Israel. When we came to the Upper Galilee, the land is near, near the border to Lebanon. When we came here, it was no trees. All the hills was barred hills only with stone without anything. 
We have no water, uh, natural water, and it was no chance to have you. We had the faith that it's needed to do, that we can do it, that we can go over all the difficulties. But it was very, very hard. In the first time, nothing was private. Even the, the cloth that you have, it wasn't private. And everything was counted up to my underwear. You were only allowed to have so and so much underwear, so and so many shirts, so and so many pants, so and so. Everything was uh, accounted for and counted. Over the years, people around the world began hearing about the kibbutz. One of these was Lyuba Dayan from the Malkia kibbutz. I got here from Holland as a volunteer in July 1968. The kibbutz was still the traditional, original form of living. Holland was, the, I remember, I could have dropped dead and nobody would have cared. And here, in the, in the kibbutz, it was something completely different. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody knows what everybody's doing. It has a lot of advantages, together with the disadvantages for some situations. When the kibbutz started its life, it was a society of very poor people. They didn't have the minimal conditions to raise children. So they created, for example, the idea that children will eat different food than the parents because the parents didn't have nothing to eat. So they had two kitchens. The house of my parents, when they finally got a house, was 20 square meters. There's no way you can put kids there. So they created houses for children. The children didn't sleep with their parents. They would live in children's houses in the center of the kibbutz. This was the palace, and the home of the parents were not named as home. It was named like a room. You have no brothers and sisters, really, because your brothers and sisters were your, your friends in the group. Your parents didn't um, educate you. They were like friends of you. So all the family look like um, a group without roles. So how it, could, how it could be a family? Well, as a mother, I, didn't, I think it's, it's wrong. So I uh, stop it. And I start to spend time with my children, in spite of all what people think about me. With the time, the idea of raising the children in the children's houses was looked as something of the old time. This is the dining room, the building of the dining room. This was the heart of the kibbutz. The work manager, the library, the club, the uh, mailboxes. The dining room of the kibbutz was really the church, the community center, the place where people ate, the place where people danced, and the most important, where the people met. And here we would meet for breakfast, lunch and dinner, and gossip, of course, like everywhere else. And this stopped when the, when the kibbutz prior went into privatization. Now it looks like this. The idealism that characterized the first years of the kibbutz did not pass on to the following generations. And so this unique social experiment stopped working. During the 80s, the entire kibbutz movement in Israel hit rock bottom, both financially and ideologically. There started to be a, a gap, a dissonance between the ideology and what people wanted. And it didn't work. Almost everything did not work, okay? What, what were the big problems? Waste, 
things that you give free, people do not pay for eventually. They do not appreciate the value and there's a lot of waste. People, if they left without food for the dogs, they would go and take the food that from the from, for the human, for human, like a chicken piece or, or meatballs and take it for the dogs. It doesn't cost money. Twenty years ago, the kibbutz movement has started to fall down, but the people in the kibbutz didn't feel it. So I think it, it was a big mistake. One of our friends, I asked him, why you will go and left us alone here? He said, I think that I, my duty did. If you don't consciously wake up every morning and choose this system again as this is the way I want to live, it's gone. So uh, the train passed away and the kibbutz uh, stay behind. I decided to take one of the biggest decisions in my life. It was to become the secretary of the kibbutz movement. I felt responsibility for the dream and I believe that I have no right not to fight in hours of crisis. In my opinion, the kibbutz, the, the kibbutz movement is over. As a unique community, she has nothing to say anymore. Today, the kibbutz, since 2002, the kibbutz is completely privatized, which took us more than four very traumatic years to come to that stage. And since then, life has changed very dramatically. But in the end, everybody said there's no other way we can survive as a community. And everybody agrees that we're now better off than we were before. The feeling that when, God forbid, something happens to you, there is a whole community that will support you, is something you can't find, I think, in any other way of, of, of life, and only in a kibbutz. We end our story at Kibbutz Shamil. This group has developed industries with a combined revenue of $0.5 billion per year. We did the transformation from a point of strength. We have uh, what we call safety nets, that a family will not pay for education more than a certain amount, for health more than a certain amount. Much more mellow, much more considerating, and it seems to, to fit the seems people. To beautifully. We are trying to keep and preserve the, the basic and the positive and the main point of the old kibbutz in the, in the new kibbutz. Despite the many hard years and hardships that the kibbutz movement faced, it's experiencing somewhat of renaissance in past years. The children and grandchildren of those who left are coming back, drawn back by the sense of community, security, and values that the kibbutz movement offers. Many, many children uh, who are parents are coming back to the kibbutz and you ask them why you want to come to the kibbutz. And they say, the way of education. My grandson came here because he liked the place and he have here members and he liked to, to live here. The children come back to the kibbutz because the life is good. They find a green places, they find a good education, but they don't want to be a, kibbu a kibbutz people. They want to be a community people. And the important thing is to understand that all the time in the kibbutz, we are discussing what are we, what we want from ourselves. And this is the big challenge. How? to change ourselves with the time, but to be faithful to the ideas.